I was raised in a family where I didn't receive much love. My mother and father were married when we were just teenagers, came to Brooklyn, New York, and after my mother had lost eight children during childbirth, she finally gave birth to me. My father didn't have much of an education, and he had to take any job that was available, and I always remember him having two jobs, and sometimes he would even have to take a third job on the weekend just to make ends meet. And I noticed my father was much different than the rest of the fathers in the neighborhood I grew up in. All the other fathers would be taking their sons fishing on the weekend, taking them to ball games, and I'd see them walking down the block with their arms around their sons, and my father never did any of those things with me. My father would come home from work, sit down and have dinner, and begin to drink. My father was an alcoholic. When my father got good and drunk, he got good and violent. And although he never raised his hands to my mother, he had up some release for that violence, and I was the release. I didn't have to say anything wrong. I didn't have to do anything wrong. All I had to do was be in the same room with him. And he would just grab me by the back of the neck and drag me in my bedroom, and he would beat me with a leather strap. Back in those days, he used a strap that was used to sharpen straight-edge razors. And I remember him just coming in the room and he would begin beating me. And when I was about 10 years old, I realized as I began crying very heavily, he would stop beating me and just turn around and walk out of the room. So at 10 years old, I made a promise to myself. If my father wouldn't show me the love and attention that I need, I'd never let him see me cry ever again. And the very next time he dragged me in the room to give me a beating, he was a big, strong man with a big leather strap and I was just a little 10 year old boy. And it took every ounce of energy in me to hold those tears back, and somehow I had managed. And I made a promise to myself. My father would never ever see me cry ever again. As the weeks and the months and the years went by, my heart became so hardened. I truly believed there was a time in my life if I wanted to cry, I couldn't cry. And I began hating my father. Hating him to the point where many nights I'd wait till he went to sleep, and I'd go in the, think about going in the kitchen, and getting a knife and slitting his throat. This is how much I began to hate my father. Usually when I got out of school, I'd go down by the waterfront to meet up with a few of my friends, and we'd play on the old piers and the old railroad tracks that were there. One day, when I was about 15 years old, I saw the handle of a gun sticking out of the rocks. I went over and I pulled this gun out of the rocks. It was an old gun, it was rusty, and I didn't know whether this gun worked or not. But when I showed it to my friends, I came up with an idea. And I told two of my friends, if we cover our faces so nobody will know who we were, we can go around and pull armed robberies with this gun and, and get a lot of money. At first, my friends were afraid, but I finally convinced them to go with me. In the first place we went in, we were very nervous, and we pulled out the gun, and we got everybody's money, and we left. We went to a place called Coney Island, an amusement park, and went on all the rides. And we were laughing how easy this was. It was so easy, we started going out, and once or twice a week, and about four or five more times, we had different robberies. We'd go into certain places if there was men there, and we thought the men would chase us after we left. We'd make, not only take their money, but we'd make the men take their pants off. And we'd take their pants with us and run away in three or four blocks, drop their pants, get on a train, and go to Coney Island, and, and go on all the rides again. Unknown to me, one of my friends went around in the neighborhood bragging what we were doing, and some people that we had robbed grabbed a hold of him, scared him into telling them who the man was that had the gun. I was sitting home one night at my mother and father at the dinner table, and there was a knock on the door. When my father answered the door, there was three men standing there, and I recognized the three men as some of the men that we had robbed money from. And they began speaking in Sicilian, and one of the men said to my father, we must come in and speak with you and your son, it's very important. And my father flew into a rage and started speaking back in Sicilian at them. And he was yelling at them, saying, I told you men never to come anywhere near my family, and I want you to leave right now. And one of the men said, if we leave right now, your son will be dead by the morning. My father told my mother to go into the next room, and he allowed these three men in. One of them came right up to me and put his finger right in my face. And he said, I know it's you that's coming in there with that gun. And the only reason you're still alive today is because the respect I have for your grandfather. 
And that didn't make any sense to me at all because both of my grandparents on my mother and father's side had died years, 15, 20 years before I was ever born. But he said, if you come in there one more time with that gun, even the respect I have for your grandfather won't help you, you'll be dead. He turned around, the three of them just walked out and left. My father grabbed me and dragged me into the bedroom and gave me the worst beating I ever remember him giving me. I still didn't cry, and when he was too tired to raise his hands to hit me anymore, I began asking him, who was my grandfather and what was my grandfather that these people can respect somebody who's been dead for so many years? And all my father would tell me is he's dead and that's all you need to know about him. But I don't ever want to see you around these men again. They're no good. Stay away from them. But I didn't listen to my father. The very next day when I got out of school, I remembered where these three men were and I went to where they were. When I walked into this storefront, the man who had pointed his finger in my face was sitting there at a table. I walked up to him and I said, I demand that you tell me who my grandfather is if you're keeping me alive because of the respect you have for him. I said, my father won't tell me who he is. And this man told me, he said, your father's a very foolish man. He doesn't have to work two and three jobs and drink himself to sleep at night just to face the next day. All your father would have to do is come and join with us and he'd never have to work another day in his life. But your father won't even talk with us. And I told this man, I didn't come here to speak about my father. I hate my father and someday I'll kill him with my own hands. I said, I came to find out who my grandfather was. He told me my grandfather was one of the men that was actually responsible for bringing what we now know as the Mafia into the United States in the late 1800s, early 1900s. He told me my grandfather was one of the most powerful bosses, one of the most wealthiest, and one of the most violent bosses that the Mafia ever had. And in the Mafia tradition, he was killed by somebody in the Mafia. This is how you usually become a boss. You don't put 20 or 30 years in and retire. You run out of patience, and you wind up having to kill kill the boss. The man who had my grandfather killed was a man named Lucky Luciano. He had my grandfather killed and he took over that family. Listening to this man, I wasn't one bit impressed with the mafia because here I was a 15 year old kid with a gun that just walked into their headquarters and took all their money and embarrassed them, even wind up taking their pants. So this wasn't my idea of what a gangster should be. But also listening to this man, I realized that I now had the most powerful tool I could ever have to get even with my father for the way he had hurt me. If my father would rather go to work two and three jobs and have to drink himself to sleep every night rather than be with these men, then the worst thing that I could ever do with my father is become whatever these men were. And I asked this man, and unknown to me at the time, this man's name was Carlo Gambino. And I asked him, I said, if my father doesn't want anything to do with this and I'm his only son, doesn't it put me next in line? And he said, yes, it does. And I said, okay, I want it. And he said, not at 15 years old. He said, your father should have been teaching you a lot of things about us. He said, but if you promise to be loyal to me, if you'll do anything I ask you to do, he said, it's all up to you how far you can go in this family. I agreed that very day that I would be loyal to him and I would do whatever he asked me to do. They started sending me out to pull arm robberies. They sent me out to do burglaries and I was always big and strong. I had a reputation as a street fighter. They would send me out to collect money from grown men. And they would say, Tom, whatever you have to do, if you've got to shoot them in the arm or the leg or stab them or beat them over the head with a baseball bat, whatever you have to do, you just do it, but make sure you bring the money back. And every time they would send me out to collect money, I would never look at the face of the man that I was about to hurt. I would make believe it was my father. And I was getting even with my father for all the beatings he had given me and for all the love he didn't give me. And I began to enjoy what I was doing, and I got a reputation as a 15, 16-year-old boy as a very violent person. And I actually enjoyed what I was doing. By the time I was 17 years old, I had earned a trusted position in the Gambino family. I was given a gun, and it was nothing like the gun I was found. This was a shiny gun. It had bullets in it, and I knew it worked. Right after I was given the gun, I rushed home to see my mother. I had the typical Italian mother when she wasn't in the kitchen cooking, she was in the bedroom praying. And I knew my father wouldn't be home, he'd be at one of his many jobs working, and I rushed home and sure enough there was my mother on her knees kneeling by the bed just praying away. And I rudely interrupted her and I said, now what are you praying about? When she turned to look at me, I could see tears in her eyes and she said, I'm praying for you. It's no secret you're involved with those men, but what you don't know, those are the men who had my father killed, it was her father who was the boss. And she says, you'll never know what it's like every time your father leaves the house. You don't know if he's ever going to come home. 
and one day he left the house with the men that you're with right now and he never came home. They've already killed my father. I don't want them killing my only son. So I'm praying that you'll walk away from these men before it's too late and instead you'll seek God for protection. I couldn't have asked for a better response. I reached behind my back and took out the gun I was just given. And I said, Mom, here's the only protection I'll ever need. I said, I can't see this Jesus who you're talking about and always praying to. I said, if I'm in trouble, I don't know if he'll be there. But I know this gun will be with me everywhere I go. And I said, this gun will take care of any problems, any troubles that ever come my way. So I don't need your God's protection. I've got my own. And my mother began to cry. And I saw her to leave the room and I turned around and I said, before I leave, is there anything else that you're praying about? And with tears streaming down her cheeks, she said, yes, I'm praying that someday you'll become a priest. And I said, what a foolish thing for my own mother to say. Nobody in this family has ever been a priest. Everybody in this family has been involved in the mafia except my father. And look at him. He has to work two and even three jobs just to bring food for us. And he gets drunk every night. I said, mom, I don't think you understand. I don't want to be like my father. I want to be like your father. And I want to be more powerful than your father was. I want to be more wealthy than he was. I said, Mom, I even want to be more violent than he was. I said, so I don't need your God's protection. I said, in fact, I don't even need your God. I said, Every, I've got everything that I'll ever need with these people that I'm with right now. So I don't want you ever praying for me ever again. She balled up her little fist, and she said, you can't stop me from praying. Those men that you're with, they've never been able to stop me from praying, and I won't stop praying until God answers my prayers. I laughed at her and I said, you're wasting your time. The very next day when I came home from school, I found all my clothes and belongings piled on the doorstep. My father had come home early from one of his jobs and was standing there and he said, you want to be with those men? Fine, you can't live in this house anymore. It didn't bother me because I was making enough money to get my own apartment. But my boss told me that he refused to allow me to quit school. He wanted me to complete my education. But now that I didn't have to go home to parents every night, I was able to spend more and more time with these men, and they were teaching me more things and giving me more responsibilities. By the time I was 19 years old, I was given my first contract. They told me there was a hijacking in the Garmin district. It was an inside job, and they already took care of the people that were involved in doing this. But there was two men who hijacked the truck, and they were hiding in another state. And they wanted me to go there and shoot both these men. And if I was told once, I was told a hundred times, Tom, whatever you do, don't kill either one of these men. We don't want them killed. All we want to do is make an example of them so nobody will ever think about stealing from us ever again. And they said, here's a driver's license in a different name. Here's a plane ticket in a different name. So when you go there, if you get stopped, nobody will know who you are. And when you get there, there'll be a man to meet you at the airport who'll know exactly who you are. And when you get there, he'll give you the keys to a rental car. When you get the rental car, Inside the glove box will be a gun, pictures of what these two men look like, and directions where they are. Go there, shoot both of them, and come right back. Everything he told me was exactly the way he explained it. I went there, the man met me, gave me the keys, I got the gun, the pictures, the directions. Found both of these men and shot both of them, got back in the car, and went back to the airport. When I got on the plane, the only people on the plane besides me was the police department. They knew my real name, placed me under arrest, brought me to jail, kept me overnight, and in the morning brought me before a judge. And the judge said, you're Italian, you're from New York, and you're here shooting people. What are you, a hitman? What are you in the mafia? And at 17 years old, I had taken a vow that I would never betray the mafia, no matter what. So every time this judge would ask me questions, I would ignore him like he wasn't even there, and it made him very angry. And he said, if you're found guilty, he said, and you still remain silent, I promise I'll send you away for the maximum amount of time that I could. I didn't bother hiring an attorney. I don't want a jury trial. I was guilty, so I just pled guilty. When I went before this judge, he started asking me the questions again, and I kept my vow of silence. He kept his promise. Sent me away for two five to 10 year sentences. When I got to this prison, even though neither my mother or father knew how to write, they had somebody write a letter. And I opened the letter and I read it, and the letter said, you've disgraced this family for the very last time. You no longer have a mother. You no longer have a father, as far as we're concerned. We no longer have a son. He's dead and buried. Don't ever write. Don't ever call. Don't ever come by the house. I was finally paroled from the first sentence to the second sentence, was let out on good behavior, put on a bus, and sent back to New York. When I got off the bus, the first thing I did was go to a friend's house to get a gun. This is the thing that I had missed most all those years, having that gun as my security, 
That gun had become a way of life with me. It was no different than one of my hands or one of my feet. But I got the gun, but I didn't go to see my boss because I felt I had let him down for the first time since I was 15 years old. But he knew that I was out, and he sent for me. When I got there, his opening words were, Hello, Tom, or Welcome Home, Tom. The first thing he said to me was, Tom, do you have a gun on you? I said, Carlo, you know I always have a gun. He said, Give me the gun, and I said, No. But I saw a table close by, and I agreed to put my gun on the table. I wanted that gun as close to me as possible if anybody was going to hurt me. I wanted to be able to get that gun and kill as many people as I could before they killed me. I put the gun on the table, walked back and sat down, and my boss began asking me questions. He said, tell me about all those years you spent in that penitentiary. And very arrogantly, I looked at him and I said, you see any broken bones? You see any scars? I said, you know I can take care of myself. I survived. And then he leaned back and he said, Tom, is there any one thought that you had more than any other thought all those years? And that was easy for me to answer because even to that very moment, I was thinking, what did I do wrong that I got myself arrested? I thought I followed his instructions exactly the way he asked me to. And this is what I told him. And he said, Tom, he said, you're not going to understand this right away, but in a few minutes you will. And he said, now you're going to know why I asked you for your gun. He said, Tom, he said, you didn't do anything wrong. He said, we called the police and gave them your real name and told them what you did. He said, Tom, you have to understand when we sent you out to make money, you always came back with a lot of money. When we send you out to hurt somebody, you usually hurt them even more than we ask you to. But we had no idea what would happen if you ever got arrested and had to go to jail. And he said, Tom, all I wanted to do is see if you can pass my test. I'm sitting there thinking, here's a man looking at me smiling because I passed his test. But in the meanwhile, I had to spend years of my life in a penitentiary that I can never get those years back. They're gone, they're lost. Was thrown out of my house. My mother and father, I couldn't contact them anymore and I didn't care about my father, but I loved my mother and I knew her heart was broken. And all this man could do is look at me and smile, happy that I had passed this test. All I thought about was getting up and getting the gun and killing him and I could care less what they did to me afterwards. But before I can get up and get the gun, he had a book in front of him that he had showed me many times before. In this book, he had names of people who owed him large amounts of money. And before I can get up and get the gun, he slid the book across the table. And he said, Tom, if you can have any type of business at all, what type of business would you want? He knew I was always fascinated by the nightclubs and the discotheques, and this is what I told him. And he said, go ahead, take one. He wasn't going to buy a nightclub for me. He wasn't going to build a nightclub for me. He was taking somebody else's nightclub. I don't know whether they didn't pay him the money back or maybe they were too slow on paying or maybe he just didn't like the way the person parted his hair. He was taking their nightclub away from them. But the minute I realized I was going to be in control of a nightclub, I forgot about killing him. I forgot about all those years I spent in the penitentiary, forgot about being just thrown out of my house and not able to see my mother and father anymore, and I found myself smiling back at him, happy that I had passed this test. I looked in the book and I said, Carlo, there's two in here that I like, and I can't make my mind up right away. I said, I need some time. He said, no, you don't. Take both of them. You've earned it. This was the beginning of me becoming a so-called businessman. Now that I had control of these businesses, I didn't have to go out and pull armed robberies. I didn't have to pull bur burglaries. I didn't have, have to go out and break arms and legs anymore to make money. Now I was a so-called businessman. Being I had a criminal record, I couldn't own these businesses outright, so I'd have other people put it in their names, but I was in total control of it. From these two restaurants and nightclubs, it went to four restaurants, six nightclubs. By the time I was in my early 30s, I was controlling over 40 different businesses, making millions of dollars a year for the Gambino family. During that time, Carlo Gambino died, one of the very few bosses to die of natural causes. Most of them die of lead poisoning. But before he died, he called his brother-in-law, Paul Castellano, to his sickbed and called me to his sickbed. And he said, Paul, if I should die, you're going to become number one of this family. But before I die, he said, I want you to make the same agreement with Tom that I made some years ago. He said, Tom's loyal. Tom will do whatever you want him to do. Tom's a moneymaker. Tom's not interested in titles or anything like that. And he said, Paul, he said, I want you to make the same agreement with him that he'll work directly for you. Paul had known me very well and made that agreement. Little did I know that that was God's hand on my life for my future. A few months later, Carlo Gambino died. Paul Castellano became number one. A few months after that, I was arrested again, had to go back to jail. But this time, it was only a two-year sentence, and it was a federal sentence. 
But it was much different than the first time I had gone to prison. It was much different for two reasons. One of the reasons being that my reputation preceded me and everybody knew who and what I was before I even arrived at this prison. The other reason being something called the American Civil Liberties Union. They've gone into most of our prisons and turns them into college campuses. If you could see some of the prisons that I go into on a weekly basis, you'll see that they have more luxuries in there than the majority of us have out here. And it's no wonder eight out of 10 people return to prison when they have it so good in here compared to what we have out here. And I had a two year sentence because of my criminal record. They wouldn't even allow me any parole. I had to max out the whole two years. I had about four months left to go. And one day the Catholic chaplain came up to me and he said, I've been watching you and you're a lot different than the rest of the men in this prison. And very arrogantly, I said, of course I am. Don't you know my position in the Gambino family? And he said, no, he said, I've been a prison chaplain for a long time. He said, I've seen a lot of people in organized crime. He said, but I see something in you I've never seen in any of them. And he said, I understand you're going home in a few months. He said, do you have any plans? And I looked at him and I laughed. I said, do I have any plans? I'm controlling over 40 businesses. I'm making a few million dollars a year. I said, what do you think I'm going to do when I get out? I said, it's back to business as usual. I said, why are you asking me this? And he looked at me very seriously. And he said, Tom, have you ever considered becoming a priest? And I looked at him and I said, you must be drinking too much of that communion wine. You must be drunk. I said, you know who and what I am. And I said, I can't be anything else. And for the next four months, every time I saw him, I walked in the opposite direction. Because that's the very last thing I remember my mother saying to me, that she was going to pray for me to become a priest and would not stop praying until God answered that prayer. And here was a prison chaplain that didn't even know my mother, whether she was dead or alive, and more or less telling me the same thing, and I didn't want to hear that. Four months went by, I was released, and finally I got back home, and I got with my boss, Paul Castellano. He looked at me, and he said, Tom, what's wrong? I see a look on your face that I've never seen before. And I said, Paul, that's the problem. I don't know what's wrong. I said, look at all the power that I have. Look at all the material things I have. Look at all the money I have. I said, Paul, even with all these things, there's something missing in my life. And the problem is, I have no idea what it is. And he looked at me and he laughed. He said, Tom, look at the lives that we lead. He said, our phones are tapped, our houses are bugged, and every time we drive someplace, there's police surveillance following us all over the place. He said, Tom, we don't have any freedom, and you just got out of jail. What do you expect? He said, take some time off, work it out of your system. You'll be OK. I took his advice. I traveled to California for a while, Arizona, Miami. And everywhere I went, the food, the climate, the people were different. But that void in my life wasn't different. And whatever it was, it was growing. Finally, I just returned back to New York, and I got heavily involved in all the construction and labor unions. I received a phone call from a friend of mine in Florida. And he told me he had a friend in Atlanta, Georgia, that wanted to open up a restaurant in Atlantic City, New Jersey. All the construction was going on with all the new hotels and casinos. And he asked me if I can find a favor or do a favor for him where he can get in with the least amount of money. I told him that I'd have to speak with this man from Atlanta, Georgia. I never did business over the telephone. And I told him, tell this guy from Atlanta to come to Brooklyn, New York, and I'd sit down and I'd speak with him. When this man came, when the appointment was made, right away I noticed he was wearing a diamond pinky ring, a Rolex watch with diamonds, had tailor-made clothing, alligator shoes. So him and I had a lot in common. And he was telling me about these restaurants they had in Atlanta, Georgia, and how prosperous they were, and how many millions of dollars they were bringing in a year. And I found that very difficult to believe. Even though I had money and did some traveling, I never had any occasion to go to the South. And the only thing I had ever known about the South is what I saw from a television program called Hee Haw. And I couldn't imagine these big, fancy, prosperous restaurants in the middle of cornfields or cow pastures. So I told him I'd have to go to Atlanta with him and check it out for myself. We'd made the arrangements. We were flying into Atlanta. The plane started landing. I looked out the window, and instead of seeing cornfields or cow pastures, I saw the skyline of Atlanta with these great big office buildings, and I was very impressed. But I was even more impressed with this man's restaurant. He took me to the four that he had in operation. And we sat down, and I said, what is your ultimate goal for this business? He said, I have four in operations now. I want to maybe open two more, build myself a log cabin in the Colorado mountains, and retire. But I saw a greater potential than he did. I realized if I could start franchising these restaurants or opening up 10 or 12 of them, I could eventually sell them to some mega corporations for millions and millions of dollars. But I didn't share that with him because that was my plan. And if I could see in doing it, I didn't plan on giving him anything at all. I was going to take all his restaurants and his money away from him. 
And I told him he wouldn't have to pay us any money at all. He can go ahead and open up his restaurant in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And all we wanted in return was a percentage of the business he now had in Atlanta. We shook hands and agreed about two and a half months later. His was one of the very first restaurants open in Atlantic City, right on the Steel Pier. A few months later, we started getting our percentage. We never had Uncle Sam as our business partner. So once a month, he put one of his employees on the plane and bring us the cash. This went on for seven or eight months, and I received a phone call from the man from Florida who originally called me. And he said, Tom, he said, have you heard what happened to our friend in, in Atlanta? I didn't think anything happened. The money was coming up every month, and that's all I was really concerned about. But he told me that some drug dealers had kidnapped him, and they wanted a million dollars, so they're going to kill him. And he said, Tom, I grew up with this kid. He said, we went to school together and everything. He said, I'd hate to see anything happen to him. Tom, is there any way that you can help? And when he asked me that, I hesitated. And I hesitated because of a reason. I hesitated. I remembered at 17 years old, Carlo Gambino telling me about all the different things they controlled in New York and all the things they were involved in. And one of the things they weren't involved in was drugs. And he told me if I ever got involved in drugs, there'd be no explanation, no second chance. I would be killed. And I knew how serious he was because two of my friends attempted to get involved in one drug deal and both of them were killed. But I was a very greedy man. And I knew if I didn't do anything at all to help this guy and they killed him, I'd be out this money each month. Plus, never being around drugs, I couldn't put the connection between a restaurant owner and drug dealer, so I agreed to help. With the connections I had, it was just a matter of days before I found out the entire story about the kidnapping. This man was originally from Detroit, Michigan, and moved to Miami and then worked his way up to Atlanta. Somebody involved in the mafia in Miami and in Detroit got together and put the kidnapping scheme together. These two men were contacted and told to meet me at one of the airport hotels in Atlanta. When I met with them, I asked them about the kidnapping and they started bragging about it, saying this guy wasn't connected with anybody and he was making millions of dollars a year and they just went right in his house and snatched him and they had him locked up in some warehouse. And they told me they already got $300,000 from him and as soon as they got the balance of the million dollars, they were gonna kill him anyway. That I informed these men that this man that they had kidnapped was one of our business associates and we wanted him freed immediately. And I told them that they couldn't keep the $300,000, they'd have to return it, but not return it to the restaurant owner, return it to us for the inconvenience they caused us to putting all these meetings together. And I told them by the time I got back to New York, I wanted a phone call from the restaurant owner letting me know that he was set free and he was safe. By the time I arrived back in New York, I received a phone call. The man was set free, he was safe, and he called me on the phone. He said, Tom, he said, I want to thank you for getting me set free, but he said, I owe you more than a thank you. He said, those men were planning on killing me, even if I paid them the balance of the million dollars. He said, Tom, I don't know if you realize it, but you actually saved my life. And he said, I don't know how I could ever repay you for that. And I said, don't worry about it, I do. Let's increase the percentage in your business that we have right now. By this time, we were making more money a month in his restaurant than he was. A few weeks went by, and we were told that the kidnappers were shot and killed. I guess the people that had to return the $300,000 didn't like what went down and had the kidnappers killed. But one man escaped, and the restaurant owner called me a few weeks later, and he told me that one of the kidnappers were back in Atlanta, and he was worried about that this man was going to kill him. And he said, Tom, is there any way you can help me? Can you send somebody down to look after me? And he said, I'll pay them anything, whatever you want. And I thought about it. I was still had this void in my life. And I thought maybe I was just burned out in New York, that everybody had known who I was and what I was. And maybe I just needed to get away from New York for a little bit longer. Plus, I was looking to take over this man's business. So I saw it as a perfect opportunity for me. So I told him rather than send somebody down, I would come down myself. 
and we agreed that I would move to Atlanta, Georgia for one year and one year only, and then whatever problems he had after that year, they were his own problems. When I moved to Atlanta, we found the most expensive area. We leased the house for me. I already had the little Mercedes convertible, the Rolex watch, all the things that the world called the status symbol. I had all those things. Moved into this neighborhood, and the people thought I was just another wealthy businessman. They had no idea who or what I was. Every other week, I'd bring an electronic expert in to check the phone to see if it was tapped, to check the house to see if it was bugged. And I knew whenever I drove someplace, looking in the rearview mirrors, I never saw any police surveillance on me. And I finally found that freedom that Paul Castellano had told me about. But even though I found that freedom, I still had a void in my life. And I still didn't know what it was. 11 and a half months went by. I managed to open up 10 restaurants and was negotiating with a large company to buy the entire restaurant chain for millions and millions of dollars. It was a Friday night. We were one of the larger restaurants and the owner came to me and said, Tom, I just received a phone call. An elderly family member died a few days ago. And tonight is the last night I can attend the funeral. And I told him, you don't need me to go to the funeral with you. I said, you go by yourself. Don't worry, nobody's going to bother you. I didn't tell him the real reason I wouldn't go to a funeral. The real reason being, at funeral, people cry. And here I was, a couple of weeks away from my 40th birthday, and the last time I cried, I was a little 10-year-old boy. It was almost 30 years. And to me, if people cried, that meant they were weak. And I was this big, tough guy, and I didn't want to be around weak people, so I had never gone to any funerals. Plus, when I did see people cry, it reminded me when I was a little boy. And that's the last thing I wanted to be reminded of, of the beatings I got from my father. So I had never gone to funerals. While he was gone, a man came in the restaurant looking for him. And my instructions were, if anybody looks for him, you send them to me first. When this man approached me, the minute I laid eyes on him, there was something I didn't like about him. He came up and asked me where the restaurant owner was. I told him it was none of his business. And I asked what he wanted with him. And he said he owes me money. I knew he wasn't one of our suppliers, but I just wanted this man out of my face and out of the restaurant. And I said, all right, how much money does he owe you? And he said, $800. And I reached in my pocket to get the 800 and started to hand it to him. And I said, what does he owe you $800 for? And he said, cocaine. Every day he buys eight grams of cocaine and pays me the next day. When I heard that, I put the $800 back in my pocket. I reached in and I got my gun and I shoved my gun right in his mouth. And I told him, if I ever see you in this restaurant again, or even on the streets outside, I said, I'll blow your brains out. And you think I won't, just nod your head, and I'll do it right now. And he turned around, he ran out of the restaurant. I was very angry, because here I thought I was protecting the restaurant owner's life, when he actually put my life in worse danger than his was. I was with this man 16, 18 hours a day, seven days a week. If we ever would have been stopped and this cocaine was found, both of us would have been arrested on drug charges. And all Paul Castellano would have to do is see it in the newspaper or see it on television that I was arrested on drug charges. They said there'd be no explanation, no second chances. I would be killed. So I was very angry that the restaurant owner put my life in this position. When he finally came back from the funeral, the minute he stepped in the door, I ran over and grabbed him, and I began hitting him. And I left him laying on the ground in a pool of his own blood. And I just grabbed him by the throat, and I told him, I'm coming back Monday morning. And if you don't sign this entire restaurant over to me, I said, I'll finish what I started tonight. I left the restaurant, got in my car, drove home, took a shower, got myself a good night's sleep. Saturday morning when I woke up, for some strange reason, I didn't go through my usual routine. I just sat at the very edge of the bed and I started taking a mental inventory. I started looking at the Mercedes parked in the driveway, this fancy house with the fancy furniture and all the gold and diamond jewelry I had. And all the money I had laying around the house. And I thought to myself, my father worked two and even three jobs and never had anything to show for it. And I've never really worked one day in my life. And look at all that I have. And everything I have, I've got it all myself. Nobody's ever given me anything. And as I sat there looking at these things, having all these thoughts, something happened in my life that was the very beginning of my life changing completely around. As I sat there with these thoughts and a small, still voice began to speak to my heart. And it wasn't a voice that you could hear with your ears. There was no thunder. There was no lightning. And Charlton Heston didn't speak. This was a small, still voice that speaks to your heart. And this voice said, yes, Tom, look at all these things. All the things you see here, they're all yours. And you've done it all yourself. But Tom, you have no idea where this life of yours is leading you. Tom, you're headed straight to hell. For the first time in my life, I trembled with fear. 
I knew this was the voice of God. Being raised a Roman Catholic, I made my own personal decision only to attend church on Christmas and Easter Sunday. I knew absolutely nothing about God other than what I saw in a movie when I was just a little kid called The Ten Commandments. And there was two things that I remembered most about that movie. One was when Pharaoh wouldn't let God's people go, God parted the Red Sea, led his people through safely, and when Pharaoh's army tried to follow them, God closed the Red Sea and drowned and killed all of Pharaoh's army. When Sodom and Gomorrah wouldn't turn from their wicked ways, God destroyed all of Sodom and Gomorrah. So I looked at my father in heaven no different than I looked at my father on earth. If you did something wrong, you were going to get punished. And I knew God wasn't going to step off his throne and come out of heaven to come down to earth and beat me with a leather strap like my father did. And I thought God was saying, you've lived such an evil and such a bad life. I'm killing you and sending you to hell. And I trembled with fear. But then I started looking at the house, the Mercedes and the Rolex and all the other gold and diamond jewelry and all the cash I had around. And a spirit of pride came in. And that spirit of pride just chased that spirit of fear right out of the house. And although I didn't see any bright lights or any angels or any of those things, I just boldly began speaking out loud. And I said, God, where were you when I was a little boy? I said, God, you're supposed to know everything. Then you know the prayer that I prayed every night as a little boy. And that prayer was, God, when my father comes home from work tonight, God, please don't let him get drunk and beat me. God, please just let him walk in my room and let him put his arms around me and say, son, I love you. And I said, God, I told you I'd even settle if he just came in the room and put his arms around me and called me son. I said, but God, you never answered that prayer because every single night he came home and got drunk and beat me. I said, God, that's when I really needed you. And I said, you were nowhere to be found. That's when I was weak. That's when I was poor. I said, God, look at me now. I'm not weak and I'm not poor. And I got even bolder and I said, how dare you come into my life now? And I said, and threaten to kill me. Who do you think you are? I said, God, you yourself just spoke to me and said, everything I've done, I've done myself. Well, if this is my time to die, I said, I'll do that myself too. I reached in the nightstand. I took out a 357 Magnum, put it to my head. And I said, God, I'm going to take my life and show that I don't need you at all at anything. Plus, I'm going to show you that I'm more powerful than you are. You can't stop me what I'm about to do. Before I had a chance to pull the trigger, the telephone rang. And I picked it up to get it out of the way. And on the other end of the line was a man who had seen me in the restaurants. He was originally from New York, and he was just a legitimate salesman. But every time he saw me or called me, he would invite me to his house to have dinner. He said his wife cooked the best Italian food in all of Atlanta. And every time he would call me, I'd give him the same answer, I'll call you back. And I never had any intentions of calling him back. And here he was calling me. I had the gun in one hand ready to take my life, and I had the telephone in the other hand with a dinner invitation. Now, that's what you would really call the Last Supper. And before I can give him my answer, he said, wait a minute. He said, it's different. Tomorrow's Sunday. He said, I know being Italian, you're probably Roman Catholic, but my wife and I want to invite you to our church tomorrow. And it's not a Roman Catholic church. It's a non-denominational church. Back in those days, that word had way too many syllables for me to even understand. But I gave him my usual answer. I'll call you back. And I hung up the phone. I thought for a few minutes, and I took the gun, and I laid the gun down. I said, God, you totally underestimate me. I said, I've been trained by the very best. No one has ever been able to con me. And I said, God, that includes you. And I said, I could read between the lines and see what you're trying to do here. I said, if you kill me right now in this house and they find my body a day or a week from now, nobody will ever know that it was you that killed me. They think I had a stroke or a heart attack. So you're trying to con me into going into this non-denominational church. So when I get there, you can kill me in front of all those people so you could show them what happens to people like me who live a lifestyle like I do? I said, God, I told you I don't fear you. I'm not afraid of you. I said, I'll go to that church, and you can't touch one hair on my head. I called this man back who invited me. I think he had a mild stroke or a heart attack when I accepted his invitation. He told me what time the services started, gave me directions how to get there. When I hung up the phone, I had called somebody to come by, wash and wax and detail the Mercedes and dip my jewelry in the jewelry cleaner so it would be sparkling. and went through all my closets picking out my most expensive clothing. Sunday morning, I got the directions and I headed towards the church. I looked at the directions and I had to make a turn into a driveway and turned into a driveway and went down a small little hill. And I came upon a type of building that I had never seen before. I didn't know what it was then. I know very well what it is now. It's called a double wide. 
You see where I lived in Brooklyn, New York, if you left anything at all on the streets overnight that had wheels on it, you wouldn't find it the next day. And the only church I've ever gone to was a great big church in Brooklyn, New York, that was about four or five New York City blocks square, about two or three hundred feet tall, and everywhere you'd look there was stained glass windows and marble statues, and it was the only church I've ever gone to in my life, and here I am looking at this double wide trailer. So I thought this possibly can't be the place, and I started to leave, but I saw the man and his wife who invited me come out on the steps. So I figured this had to be the place, and turned around, parked the car, got out of the car, and walked into this church. The first step I took into this church, I saw things in this church I had never seen before in the Catholic church when I went to it in the 50s and the 60s. I looked over in the corner, and there was a set of drums, a bass guitar, a lead guitar, keyboards. I had never seen those things in the church when I had gone to the church. But everywhere I looked, from the smallest child to the oldest person there, they had this silly little smile on their face, and their eyes just seemed to be glowing. They looked like the happiest people in the world. And I thought to myself, look at this building. None of them have a car like I do. None of them have jewelry or clothes like I do. And probably none of them have a house like I do. What do these people have to be so happy about? If they knew how much I had and how little they would have, they'd be the ones crying, and I'd be the only one with this silly little smile. And everywhere I looked, it just never stopped. And then a man got up and said, let the worship begin. They started singing songs in this church that sounded like some of the songs I had sang in my nightclub. And everywhere I looked, these smiling faces just never stopped. I was so busy looking at all these faces, I never heard one word that was preached that morning. All of a sudden, the service was over, people were leaving. Back then, my pastor weighed well over 350 pounds, and he used to stand in the doorway, and as people were leaving, he used to shake their hands. Well, you know if you're over 350 pounds and you stand in the doorway of a double-wide trailer, you are the doorway. Nobody's getting out without shaking your hand. And I thought if I waited till everybody shook his hand, he'd get tired and leave, but he fooled me. He stood there and waited for me. So there was only one way in and one way out. I had no choice. I finally got up, and he reached his hand out to shake my hand, and I shook his hand. And he said, thank you for coming to our church. You can come back here anytime you want. You're always welcome here. And I said, get out of my way. I'm trying to leave. When he stepped aside, I went to walk out the door, and he grabbed me by my arm. And I turned around, I smacked his hand off my arm, and I got right in his face. I said, don't you ever put your hands on me, and this is the only warning you'll ever get. And he continued to look straight in my eyes, something most men hadn't been able to do most of my adult life. Paul Castellano and I had a little inside joke when he used to send people out to collect money. They'd come back and say, Paul, I put a gun to the guy's ribs. I put a knife to his throat, and he's just not going to pay. Paul would look at me and say, Tom, show them how it's done. I'd walk right into this man's place of business, right past his secretary, kick the door to his office open, put both my hands on his desk, and say, Paul sent me here to collect some money. Look into my eyes, tell me what you see if I have to leave here empty-handed. Nine out of 10 times, a man would look in my eyes and say, I see my own funeral. And within a matter of hours, would come up with all the money. But this man continued to look straight in my eyes. He didn't even blink. And then he said to me, I have something to say to you, and I hope I don't offend you. And I said, if you offend me, it's going to be the very last thing you ever do. And he said, the eyes are the windows to the soul. And all the time I've been looking in your eyes, all I've been able to see is a little boy crying, wanting to be loved. And he said, Jesus loves you. And he opened his arms and came towards me. He said, and I love you. And I jumped back a few feet being involved in nightclubs and restaurants and discotheques and having a lot of money there was always women coming around telling me how much they loved me but i never had a man come and tells me he loved me but the minute this man said this i made a decision right there and then to kill this man you see the only reason that i was able to get a good position in the gambino family a trusted position is because i had a reputation that i had absolutely no weaknesses and I thought I was the only one in this world that knew that little boy was still inside me, still wanting to be loved and accepted by his father more than anything else in the world. I didn't join the mafia to be a tough guy. I got involved with them to hurt my father. And after I hurt my father beyond my wildest dreams, I truly believed that I was stuck in a lifestyle that nobody could get out of. And believing that I was stuck in it, I just tried to make the best of it. But now somebody knew my secret. I couldn't take a chance in telling anybody, and my secret got out.
that I did have weaknesses. So right there and then I made a decision before I returned to New York, I was going to kill this man. I started to leave and he handed me his business card and his home phone number was written on it. And he said, for some strange reason, God has placed a burden on my heart for you, has it, like he hasn't done in over 20 years of ministry. He said, let's get together during the middle of the week. He said, you and I need to talk. And I took his card and walked out very angry, walked right past the people who invited me to the house, got in the car and drove out of the parking lot and got home. When I got home, I started slamming doors, breaking things, throwing things around the house. I was very angry. My plans were to go to Atlanta, Georgia for one year and one year only sell these restaurants for millions and millions of dollars and go back to New York and live happily ever after. My plans did not include killing anybody. And here I was just one week before my year would be up and I was returning back to New York. And now this pastor was forcing me to change my plans. Well, my patience never made it till the middle of the week. It lasted till about 9.30, 10 o'clock that night. I took out the pastor's business card. I called him at his home. When he answered the phone, I said, you remember me? I'm the guy you looked in my eyes. And he said, yes. What can I do for you? How can I help you? I said, I'm not waiting till the middle of the week. I said, you're going to meet with me tonight. He said, fine. He said, I live right down the street from the church. He said, Let me, let's meet at the church. He said, it'll be just you and I there. We'll have total privacy. And I thought to myself, this guy just helped me commit the perfect crime. He doesn't know my name. Nobody in the church knows my name. Nobody knows I'm going to meet with him. I can just go there, empty my gun in his head and kill him, turn around, get in my car and drive home. And nobody will ever suspect it was me. I agreed, and I left the house, I went back to the church. When I got there, I saw a light out at the end of the building and got out of the car. I took my gun out of my shoulder holster, made sure I had one in the chamber, made sure the clip was full, put it back into the holster. My plans were the minute I walked in there and laid eyes on him, I was going to empty my gun on his head and turn around and walked out. But he must have heard me walking down the hallway because the minute I went to turn in his office, he was standing right there looking at me. And he said, what's your name? And I thought I could tell him my name. I'm going to kill him in a few seconds. What's the difference if he knows my name? And I told him my name, and he turned around to go to walk towards his desk. As he turned around, I came up and reached for the gun. When my hand got about an inch or two away from the gun, my hand just froze like a piece of steel. I couldn't move any of my fingers. I couldn't move my wrist. I couldn't move my arm, not even my shoulder. And I thought I had come down with a stroke, and I was struggling to reach the gun. All I wanted to do was get my gun out and shoot him and kill him. And get myself to a hospital and see what was wrong with me. And my arm was shaking trying to reach the gun and this pastor looked at me and he said, Tom, you look nervous, why don't you sit down? If he knew what I was trying to reach, he would have been the nervous one and got up and ran out. But I thought whatever's wrong with me, if I sit down, maybe it'll be easy to reach the gun. But when I sat down, it was the same thing. I could look and see my fingers inches away from the gun, but not able to grab it. And he began asking me questions. He said, Tom, do you know Jesus Christ? I said, of course I do. All Roman Catholics know Jesus. He said, well, if you were to die right now, do you know where you would go? I said, yes. He said, where? I said, well, not right away, but eventually I'll get to heaven. He said, you say that with some confidence. What gives you that confidence? I said, it's simple. At one month old, my mother and father brought me to the Catholic church, and the priest sprinkled some holy water on my head, and hey, eventually I'm going to heaven. So he said, well, praise God, then you must be born again. I said, born what? He said, born again. I said, what are you talking about born again? I said, I'm six foot two, 230 pounds. I'm almost 40 years old. I said, how can I be born again? And this man had a book in front of him, just like my boss did. But this man's book didn't have names of people who owed large amounts of money. This man's book had one name of somebody who paid everybody's debt. This man had the Bible. And he opened it up, and it was the first time in my life I've ever seen the inside of a Bible. And he went to the book of John, the third chapter, the third verse. And he said, Tom, in John 3 and 3, the word of God says, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. I said, OK, you've got that book there with all the answers. You tell me just how I do that. And he turned to the book of Romans, the 10th chapter, the ninth verse. He said, Tom, in Romans 10, 9, the word of God says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved or born again. He said, did you say that at one month old? I said, of course not. Babies can't speak at one month old. He said, Tom, how would you like to become part of this congregation? And I laughed at him the same way I laughed at my mother, the same way I laughed at the chaplain in the prison. And he said, why are you laughing? I said, I'm a sinner. I said, you don't want a sinner in your church. And I said, I'm probably the worst sinner you'll ever meet. 
He said, Tom, don't say that. You're no different than anybody in this church. He said, in fact, you're no different than me. And I said, how can you say something like that when you don't even know me? He said, it's not me. And went back to the book of Romans, the third chapter, the 23rd verse. He said, Tom, in Romans 3.23, the word of God says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He said, see, you're no different than anybody else in this church, not even any different than me. Well, that offended me. I didn't spend most of my life in and out of penitentiaries and prisons. I've been stabbed, I've been shot, and I, I don't want to be equal to this guy. And I just told him, I said, I'm going to tell you all the things that I've done. I'm going to tell you about the lifestyle that I've been living for the past 23 years so you'll understand that I've lived such a bad lifestyle that God himself, it's too late for him to help me. And I thought back as far as I could remember and started telling him all the things that I had done. I don't know how much time went by. I had a strange feeling. I, my eyes were closed and I opened my eyes and I wasn't sitting in the chair anymore. I was on my knees in the middle of his office. And for the first time in 30 years, I was crying. And I was crying uncontrollably. The tears were just rolling down my cheeks. My shirt was soaking wet. My jacket was wet. And I looked at the desk and the pastor was gone. And I turned to my side, and he was on his knees next to me with tears in his eyes. And I said, what are you crying for? He said, don't you know what just happened? I said, yeah, I came in here like a tough guy, and I just made a complete fool of myself. I said, let me get up and get out of here. And he grabbed me with both hands. But this time, I didn't push him away. And very softly, he said to me, Tom, no. He said, Tom, you've just opened up a door in your heart to let Jesus in. He said, Tom, I don't care how long we have to stay here tonight. He said, but please don't leave here without letting me lead you in the sinner's prayer. I had never even heard that before. I had no idea what the sinner's prayers were. But when I look in this man's eyes, he had something that I desperately wanted. And I said, I don't know that prayer. And I said, I've never heard of it before. And he said, that's okay. You won't find it anywhere in the Bible. He said, I'll just say it and you just repeat it after me. And every time he said something and I repeated it after him, I could actually feel all the years of the hurt, the pain, the rejection, just slowly fading away. And by the time I repeated the last thing that he said, all of those feelings were completely gone. I have felt as if somebody took in thousands and thousands of pounds of weight off my shoulder. And he put his arms around me and he whispered in my ear and it was almost 16 years ago, but I can remember it like it was 16 minutes ago. He said, Tom, old things are in the past. All things are new. You are now a new creation in Christ. When he said the words new, I not only heard it with my ears, but I felt it in my heart. And right there and then I realized what that void had been in my life all those years. It wasn't religion. A religion will bring you to quicker to hell than anything else you can come up with. It was a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And now that I had Jesus Christ deep in my heart, nothing and nobody would ever be able to take him away from me. And I continued to cry, and the pastor said, Tom, you look completely worn out. He said, why don't you go home and get a good night's sleep, and if you'll tell me where you live, I don't imagine you'll have a Bible, but tomorrow morning I'll come by and I'll bring you a Bible. I told the pastor where I lived and left, and all the way home I continued to cry. I, I truly believe God took 30 years of those tears that I held in and just released me from them. When I got home, I tried to find the spot where God first spoke to my heart, and when I thought I found it, I fell on my face. And I said, God, please forgive me. I said, I'm not more powerful than you. I said, God, I'm nothing without you. I can't even wake up in the morning and breathe the air if you don't supply it for me. God, please forgive me for thinking I was more powerful than you. And I said, God, now that I know you as a God of love and mercy and forgiveness and not a God of wrath and punishment, I said, God, please don't kill me. I don't want to die. And it was God's turn to laugh at me. And God said, kill you. I'm going to raise you up for ministry. I believe every angel in heaven ministered to me that night. I don't remember a more peaceful night in my life. The very next morning, the pastor came to my house, as he said he would. When he rang the doorbell and I opened the door, he said, Tom, please forgive me. There's been an accident in one of the congregation. They're in intensive care, and I can't stay here. i got to go to the hospital. But here's the Bible I told you I would bring you, and you read it, and I'll try to come back later. I had no idea how to read a Bible. I never read one before. I never owned one before. And I didn't know if you read it like a book, starting at chapter one and just work your way through. So I just opened it up. And the very first thing that I ever read brought back all that hatred, all that rage, and all that anger. Because the very first thing I ever read was Matthew 6, 24. 
And in Matthew 6, 24, the Word of God says, you cannot serve two masters. You either love one and hate the other. And reading that scripture, I realize there's no such thing as neutral ground. There's no such thing as middle ground. There's definitely no such thing as doing your own thing. If you're not doing God's thing, whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, you're doing the devil's thing. That's how good he is deceiving us. And this is why the Bible calls him the father of all lies. And I was so angry that here I was bragging all my life that nobody was ever able to con me. Yet I allowed the devil into conning me into living a lifestyle that God never intended for any living creature to live. And I was just outraged at it. And I lifted up both my hands to heaven. And I said, God, here I am. I surrender myself completely to you today. Whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to say, God, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. All I ask in return is that you use me better than I've allowed the devil to use me. You better be careful what you pray. The first thing God put upon my heart, I could no longer be a gangster and be a minister of his. I called up my boss and I told my boss, I said, I'm not coming back. He totally misunderstood me. He thought I wasn't coming back to New York. And he said, whatever you got going in Atlanta, you want me to send a crew down to help you? He said, you know, what about what you got going here in New York? How do you want me to handle it? And I said, Paul, you don't understand. I don't mean I'm not coming back to New York. I said, Paul, I said, I'm not coming back to that lifestyle. I've accepted Jesus Christ in my heart as my Lord and Savior. And the Tom Papania that you knew was dead and buried, never to be risen again. He said, Tom, he said, You've been like a son to me all these years. And you know as well as I do, there's one way in, and that's feet first, and there's one way out, and that's in a coffin. And he said, if you're serious about not coming back and quitting, you know what I'll have to do. I'll be forced to put a contract out on you. I said, Paul, have you ever read the Bible for yourself? He said, what are you talking about? I said, do you think God would come into my life now at almost 40 years of age, forgive me of all my sins, and call me into ministry just so somebody like you can kill me? I said, Paul, in John 8, 36, the Word of God says, when the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Paul, I quit. I'm out. He hung the phone up, unknown to me at the time, a contract was put on my life. The very next thing God spoke to my heart was to get in touch with my father and reconciliation. My father was the very last person I ever wanted to get in touch with. But I had just asked God to, to come into my life, and I told him I would do anything he wanted me to do, and I didn't want to fail him that soon, and God knows I failed him enough throughout the years. I had to call up information to find out if they had a phone, and they had a phone, and when I called, my father answered the phone. And although he hadn't heard my voice in over 23 years, he recognized my voice and started yelling at me, how dare you call here? Haven't you disgraced this family enough? We told you we don't have a son anymore. We told you you don't have a mother and father. How dare you call here? What do you want? I said, Dad, I want your forgiveness. I said, Dad, I miss you and my mother so much. I love the two of you so much. I said, Dad, please don't hang up the phone. Please tell me you forgive me. And he said, what's wrong with you? I said, Dad, for the first time in my life, there's something right with me. I said, Dad, I've got Jesus in me now. And I said, you're going to be real happy to hear this. I just got off the phone with Paul, and I said, Dad, I quit. I'm out of that lifestyle. Growing up as a little boy, I had never, ever seen my father smile. I never, ever heard his laughter. All I ever saw was that drank, drunken, angry face and the sound of that leather strap hitting my back. But when I told my father I had left that lifestyle and quit, he began to cry. I never believed my father was capable of crying. And finally, after 40 years, he, he said the words that I've been wanting to hear for so long. He finally called me son. And he said, son, please don't do that. I'd rather know you're alive, even if you're with those men, than to find out that they've killed you. I said, Dad, you know how Mom's been praying for me to seek God for protection all these years? I said, Dad, if you could see me right now, you would see both of God's arms wrapped tightly around me. I said, Dad, you'll never have to worry about me again. For 23 years, I've been serving God, Fathers, but for the rest of my life, I'm serving Father God, and no mafia, nothing the world could throw my way. could ever, ever hurt me ever again. And my father said, no, I need your forgiveness. He said, I tried so hard to be a good father to you, and I failed. I said, Dad, how did you ever show it? He said, son, who do you think I went to work all those jobs for? I wanted you to have everything so you'd never be attracted to that lifestyle, but I failed you. And I said, no, Dad, you didn't fail me. I'm responsible for my own decisions. 
You see, the problem with us men, the only examples we have of being a husband or a father is our own fathers. And I found out that my father's father told him that if you provide food and clothing and shelter for your family, that's showing them love. When my father told me that, I realized that he was being the best father to me that he ever knew how. And we just cried for what seemed like hours for giving each other. And finally I said, Dad, let me speak to my mother. And he said, son, I can't do that. You'll never know how you've broken your mother's heart. And even though I believe you that you changed, if I tell her that you changed in a week, a month, a year from now, you go back to that lifestyle, you'll break her heart all over again and she can never live through it a second time. But I love you and I'll be praying for you and you can call here anytime you want. I hung the phone up and started looking at all the material things and all the things that I had around the house. And God just spoke to my heart and started telling me, get rid of everything that you didn't work for. I said, God, that's everything. I've never worked a day in my life and I just started giving the things away. And God gave me the worst news yet. He said, now go out and find yourself a job. But the Bible says that he who began a work in us is faithful to complete it. God didn't just throw me out to the streets. I picked up the Atlanta newspaper and I started looking in the want ads and the first thing that caught my eye was a position for an operations manager and let's face it, back then who could operate and manage better than I could? I called up and made an appointment for an interview. A few days later I went to the interview. When I got there there was two men in front of me and while they were going in to be interviewed, the interviewer's secretary would call him from time to time for a phone call. And I'd hear him on the telephone, well, thank you, Jesus, praise God, hallelujah. So I thought, hmm, a Christian. Finally, it was my turn to go in, and he said, can I have your resume? Can you imagine my resume? A liar, a thief, a womanizer. The only thing I qualified for was president. And I said, I don't have a resume. I said, I have a testimony. He said, well, let me hear it. And I started sharing my testimony, and halfway through the testimony, he said, stop, the job is yours. Now let me hear the rest. Now let me show you how God has a sense of humor. Born and raised on the streets of Brooklyn, New York, if you'd look in Webster's Dictionary on the street person, you'd probably see my picture right next to it. So where does God find me a job as an operations manager in a dairy farm in Atlanta, Georgia? And I took the job and I never missed one minute of work. I reported to work every day. I got involved with my church and volunteered for everything you can volunteer for in the church. And Every time the church doors opened, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, I was there. And at night I enrolled in a Bible college. I was so hungry and thirsty to know God's will for my life and what he wanted in my life and not what I wanted. I received a phone call one day from a doctor that I had known. I had known this doctor for more than 20 years. He was my next door neighbor. But he called me up to tell me something that I didn't know. He told me he had been my mother's doctor for over 15 years. And he told me my father made him promise never to tell me that he was my mother's doctor because he was a cancer doctor and I didn't know it, but my mother had cancer. But he said, Tom, he said, I'm breaking that promise today because I've admitted your mother into the hospital. She's got bone cancer and I don't think she's going to live another week or two, so I'm breaking that promise. And I know you'd want to see your mother one last time. I thanked him. I called up the dairy. I was only able to get a two days leave of absence. and. I had to take an advance and pay for a $275 plane ticket to go to New York. A year earlier, I could have bought my own plane and my own crew. This is the drastic lifestyle change I was living. When I flew to New York and went to the hospital, I didn't walk right into the hospital room because I hadn't seen my mother in 23 years. I had no idea what she looked like anymore. So I just leaned up against the wall and I closed my eyes and I tried to remember what she looked like the very last time I had seen her. And I closed my eyes and I saw this little four foot eleven Italian woman, 170 pounds, with the wooden spoon in the hand that she used to stir the pasta. And a great big smile broke out on my face and I rushed into the hospital room. But the minute I saw my mother, my smile went away and my heart was broken in millions of pieces. The cancer had my mother down to about 65 pounds. She looked like a skeleton laying there with just one thin layer of skin stretched over her. And on the nightstand was a picture of me when I was three years old and I could hear my mother praying for me. And I've never witnessed such unselfishness in my life to this day. Here was my mother told she had cancer, that she'd be dying within a week or two at the most. And her greatest priority, her only concern was where her son was going to spend eternity. And when I saw this, I just broke down and cried. I rushed over to her side. When I leaned down to hug her, my tears fell off my face onto her face. And she just gently pushed me back and she said, son, if you only knew how many years I've been waiting just for this. If you only knew how I've been asking God to keep me alive long enough just to see this. 
I said, Mom, I've changed. She said, I know, son. I said, Mom, I'm not involved in the mafia anymore. She said, I know, son. And I knew my father hadn't said a word to her. I said, Mom, how do you know these things? She said, son, when I look into your eyes, all I can see is Jesus. I don't have to pray for you anymore. God has finally answered my prayers. I had never asked God for one single thing. I was so happy with his free gift of salvation, something we can never earn, something we can never deserve, that if God never gave me another thing but the free gift of salvation, I would have been totally content the rest of my life. But I fell to my knees in that hospital room and I prayed like never before, asking God to heal my mother. I said, God, all these years she's been praying for me to be a man of God. All she's ever seen was newspaper reports and television reports about all the crimes they said I committed. I said, now that I'm finally the man of God that she prayed me into being, God, please don't let her die. I prayed all that morning, all that afternoon, that night. I had to return back to my hotel room. I stayed up all night praying in the spirit. The next day I returned to the hospital room, prayed all day again. There wasn't one single change in my mother. Finally, my two days were up and I had to return back to Atlanta. And I shamefully admit I went back to Atlanta expecting the worst. About three nights later, in the middle of the night, the phone rang, waking me up. It was the doctor. I got on the phone, and he said, Tom, he said, I have some news about your mother. I said to the doctor, you just come out and tell me just like it is. I know where my mother's going. I said, you don't have to hold anything back. He said, Tom, it's not that easy. He said, you see, every other day I was running tests on your mother so we could see how the cancer's spreading, so we'd have an idea how much longer she had left to live. But the two days that you were here, we canceled all the tests because I wanted you to spend every minute with her because I know you hadn't seen her in over 20 years. But after you left, we resumed the test again. And he said, Tom, I know it's late in the morning. I woke you up, but I've been in my office all day long. And he said, I don't know what to make of this. In my left hand, I have all the test results that we took before you came here. And even an untrained eye could see the cancer throughout your mother's entire body. He said, in my right hand, I not only have the results of my own laboratory, but I brought an outside laboratory in. And he said, Tom, I don't know how to explain this to you. He said, but none of us can no longer find one single cancer cell throughout your mother's entire body. Somehow, some way, it just disappeared. He said, I've never seen anything in, like this in my life. And he said, I wish there was somebody who can explain it to me. I said, I could. He said, tell me. I said, I brought another doctor in. He got very indignant with me, he started raising his voice. And he said, how dare you bring another doctor in? And why don't he consult with me? And why don't he get your mother's medical records? And what did he do to your mother? What's this doctor's name? When he finally calmed down, I said, his name is Dr. Jesus. And according to the book of Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, the fifth verse, by his stripes, my mother is healed. Instead of my mother dying within a week or two, this doctor released my mother from the hospital and sent her home. Two and a half months later, she was well on her way back to that 170 pounds. God had completely healed her. A son was now a man of God. She prayed him into being. A year went by. It was 1985, and it was one whole year since I had changed my life. I was living a good Christian life. I had read in the newspapers and seen on television that my ex-boss, Paul Castellano, was arrested, along with the other four bosses of the five crime families in New York. I paid no attention to it because I was out of that lifestyle. But one day I received a a letter in my mailbox from the Justice Department saying that when Paul Castellano was brought on the stand, they were going to subpoena me to come and testify against Paul. That Sunday when I went to church, I showed my pastor the letter and I said, Pastor, if I go to New York to testify against Paul, they'll kill me the minute I get off the plane. But if I don't go to New York, then I'm denying everything that God has done in my life and they may send somebody here and I don't want you or anybody in the church getting hurt for me. I said, what do you do in a situation like this? He said, Tom, there's only one thing you could do, and that's pray. He said, why don't we just pray right now? And he just prayed a simple little prayer of protection over me. I didn't think much of the prayer, and a couple of months went by. I came home from work one night. I turned on the 6 o'clock news, and the first thing I saw was Paul Castellano laying dead in the streets of midtown Manhattan. Nine days before Christmas, him and his bodyguard were getting out of their car, going into a steakhouse. And they said four people came out of the doorways and shot and killed both of them. And now a man named John Gotti was claiming to be boss of that family. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to say that God killed Paul Castellano for me. I know he didn't. God doesn't work that way. But the Bible says we reap what we sow. If you plant onions, you could only get onions. If you plant carrots, you could only get carrots. 
If you planned violence, you could only get violence. He lived a violent life. He died a violent death. But two scriptures came to pass with the death of Paul Castellano. Being that he was the only one I worked for, the only one I was responsible to, when he died, every connection that I had to that family died with him. When the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. He was the only one that had a contract on me. When he died, the contract died. The second scripture, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Totally free from a lifestyle most of the world will tell you you can never be free from. And that's partially true. You can't do it on your own. You can't even do it with the government's witness protection program. But I serve a God who says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Totally free from that lifestyle. And since then, I've been back to Brooklyn, New York about a dozen times. And it all started me walking into this place with a weapon and it ended with me walking in a place with a weapon, the Bible, the greatest weapon I'll ever possess. Totally free from this lifestyle. My mother lived for 18 months since she was released from that hospital. One night during the 18th month, I imagine she said her prayers like she usually did. There was no sickness, no pain, no illness. She laid her head down on the pillow and God just mercifully and gracefully took my mother home. But the night that God took my mother home, I was sitting in the maximum security cells of the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary facing a 400-year sentence. The restaurant owner finally got busted with all his drugs when the FBI and DEA went in there and looked at his books. They found my name in there and saw how much money I was getting, came and arrested me. They had me locked up in the maximum security cells of the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. Locked up in an eight foot six by cell, 23 hours a day, only allowed out one hour a day to take a shower and exercise. And I thought for sure that God knew I was totally innocent of these charges. This was the first time I was ever in jail when I was completely innocent. All the other times I was guilty and I took whatever punishment was dealt to me. But this time I was completely innocent and I was looking at a death sentence, 400 year sentence. Nobody lives 400 years. And I just asked God, why was this going on? And God spoke to my heart and he said, I know you're innocent, you know you're innocent. He said, take your eyes off the circumstances, keep your eyes on me. But that was very hard for me to do because I was the only one locked up there on the, on the fifth floor of this maximum security cell. I was all by myself. And I took my eyes off the circumstances and I started worrying about this jail sentence I was about to get. One day, one of the officers came up there and they opened the doors and they told me to, told me to stay in my cell. I heard three doors slam, so it wasn't hard for me to figure out. I now had three neighbors. The very next day, when they opened the doors for the one hour, the four of us came out. We looked at each other. The three of them ran back in and closed their cells. These were the three men who were hired to kill me. And they put them in the cells right next to me, and we were all out the same hour each day, unsupervised. I went and took a shower, and when I took the shower, I began crying. I said, God, these men tried to kill me, and here they are in the cells right next to me, and I'm going to jail for the rest of my life. I'm going to die in this jail anyway. And I said, God, I can't spend the rest of my life in jail knowing I didn't do anything. So if I'm going to spend the rest of my life in jail, it's got to be because I know I've done something. Tomorrow, when they open up these doors, I'm going to kill these three men. Then I'll know why I'm spending the rest of my life in jail. The next day, when they opened the doors, I walked out, and the only words that came out of my mouth to these men was, I know you guys tried to kill me, but I forgive you, and Jesus forgives you, and I love you, and Jesus loves you. And I started sharing with them what God had done in my life. And the next thing you know, I was leading all three of them in the sinner's prayer. I spent a total of 11 and a half months incarcerated, uh, waiting for the trial. The trial itself was over four months. They claim it was Atlanta's longest trial. I had 57 witnesses against me, and everything looked like I was going to go to jail for the rest of my life, but God had other plans. Finally, after all the witnesses came forth and spoke against me, God spoke in the courtroom. The jury went into deliberation. After 10 days of deliberation, they came out. There was six people involved in this case. They read the first few names. Everybody was found guilty. Finally, the jury foreman said my name. I stood up, and every charge that I had, they said not guilty. When he finally said the, not real, the last not guilty, I couldn't contain myself. I actually jumped up on the table and shouting, hallelujah, free at last, free at last. Good God Almighty, free at last. I was finally totally free of all these charges after 11 and a half months. I had lost everything I had. All I had was the clothes on my back when I was arrested. I was released and somebody from the church came to pick me up and they took me in so I could stay in their home. 
Sunday, they brought me to church. It was the first time in 11 and a half months I was in church. They said I was too dangerous to even let out the church in the Atlanta Penitentiary. When I got to this double wide trailer, it no longer looked like a double wide trailer. It now looked like the Taj Mahal. They had seven acres of trees there and land, and every tree had a yellow ribbon on it, and there was a big banner hanging over the door of the church. Welcome home, Brother Tom. Always remember, God will never, ever leave you or forsake you. I don't remember feeling any more love than I ever did that morning. That night, I went home, I went home to these people's house, and I said my prayer, and I said, God, tomorrow morning, let me call up the dairy and get my job back and put all of this behind me like none of this ever happened. And God spoke to my heart and said, Tom, you'll never work for man again. You're going to work for me. I said, all right, do I go to work for my church? And he said, no. I said, well, do I go to work for another church? And he said, no. I said, what Christian organization do I work for? And he said, none. I said, God, if I don't work for any of these organizations, what is my food, my clothing, and shelter come from? And he said, I am Jehovah Jireh, which means God the provider. He said, I shall provide all your need according to my riches and glory. God called me into prison ministry, one of the last places I ever wanted to go back. But he opened the doors for me in the prison. I was able to go in. I was able to go into inner cities and share with the youth gangs what being in a gang was really about. And God just started blessing the ministry, opening doors for me all over to share my testimony. Not only in the prisons, not only in inner cities, but God opened doors for me to speak in churches. This was almost 17 years ago. If somebody would have told me that I would be an ordained minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ and I would be called an evangelist and sharing my testimony all over the world 17 years ago, I probably thought they were crazy and shot them, put them out of their misery. But you see, when God looks at us, he doesn't look at the outside person. He looks at our hearts. And God probably looked at me and said, there's a little boy with a broken heart that needs a father. If he'll only reach out and touch my hand, I'll be the father that he never had. And I love him unconditionally. I love him just the way he is. And I realize now that God loved me just as much when I was walking around carrying a gun as he does right now that I'm one of his ministers going around sharing the gospel. And if God can do this with a piece of scum and filth and trash like me, God can do this with anybody. And you may be listening to all this and saying to yourself, well, Tom, you know, it, it's good for you, everything I've heard, but I've never done the things that you've done. And I've never even dreamed of living the lifestyle that you have. And Tom, basically, I'm a good person. I'm good to my wife, good to my husband, good to my children, good to my parents. Ask my neighbors, ask the people I work with. I'm a good person. Well, if you do all those things, I'd have to agree with you, you're a good person. But I got some bad news for you today. Good people don't go to heaven. This is what I said, good people don't go to heaven. John 3 and 3 only says one thing. It does not say in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be good. It does not say in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you have to belong to any denomination. John 3 and 3 does not say in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you have to have perfect church attendance. I can go to McDonald's every day. I'll never be a Big Mac. The only thing that John 3 and 3 says, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. And some of you may be saying, well, okay, Tom, how do I do that? Very simple, Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. The Bible, not Tom Papania, says you, so you shall be saved or born again. What I would like for you to do right now is you're listening to this. I would just like for you to just search your heart. And I'd like to lead you in a prayer that Pastor Kelly of Landmark Church in North Cross, Georgia, led me in almost 17 years ago. A prayer that just radically changed my life around. So I would like for you to just repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner, and I confess my sins to you, and I repent of my sins, asking you to forgive me. I believe that Jesus Christ is the only Son of God, was born of a virgin, was crucified, and on the third day, God raised him from the dead. With this confession of faith, I invite you, Jesus Christ, into my life, not only as my Savior, but as the Lord of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me today of all my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. If you've said this prayer for the very first time, I welcome you to the family of God. 